Been having, uh, as I uh, put <coughs> and trying to explain on <coughs> the noise on the sonobody sections, I've been having uh, some uh, problems, so I wasn't able to interrupt uh, him now to make this new uh, lecture uh, movies. So uh, it's been actually a problem. So I don't know actually how to uh, <coughs> correctly. Uh, handle this problem and after a long thought uh, so that's why I have finally decided to uh, <coughs> push this our originally scheduled exam day to, to several days later to the uh, December 23rd which is pretty uh, late uh, considering all those <coughs> the administrative uh, the academic scheduling uh, which include the grading, the deadline for the grading report is actually uh, the day earlier, I guess, or oh, maybe the, the day after, 21st. Uh, so in other words, well, I, I'm not really quite sure. So in other words, after our exam, final exam is finally over, uh, so one day or two, probably won't be able to uh, get <coughs> When all those reporting or final grade reporting is open, still uh, you, you folks probably will be left out in the blackout uh, at least uh, a couple of days. That uh, is one, one of those inconveniences you have to uh, put up with. Uh, my once again, my sincere apology uh, to those things due to my this <coughs> uh, a little personal turmoil but uh, that's what it is uh, however I think still uh, the having the rescheduling of this final exam uh, with this very squeeze the narrow window of the makeup time for the lecture this I think this the right thing to do so that at least you can have uh, a little more time to digest all this lecture material so that's why i have decided to uh, have uh, this exam day delay and another thing is so uh, i'm going to try to pour uh, as much as possible the lecture material in the meantime so uh, today uh, i am planning on to make uh, the two weeks worth of a lecture uh, i'm trying to but then another problem is uh, it takes uh, always it takes a lot of time to <coughs> have this processed so uh, that's with on uh, on top of everything uh, and many other things to worry about this real 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 problems so, uh, sorry yeah. and speaking of this exam mm, so this December 23rd is not on our uh, regular the lecture timing schedule wise so <coughs> uh, two or three students actually uh, <coughs> notified me about not being able to make this newly scheduled uh, final exam so uh, to give them an, an, another uh, alternative uh, exam date choice so we after a uh, couple of back and forth uh, communication with them uh, I have uh, made another alternative exam date which is on the December 20th the, uh, which is on Sunday uh, same exam time as a 5 o'clock p.m. 
So three uh, students will be uh, taking this final exam for uh, themselves on Sunday, uh, December 20th, instead of uh, December 23rd, which is Wednesday, uh, I guess. So uh, what I'm, uh, the reason why I'm letting you uh, know uh, is, so any other student, if any of you are, are additional uh, student wishes to take this alternative exam date, early exam date, December 20th, you all are also welcomed to uh, join in. So originally I was going to announce this, uh, the Zoom info, logging in Zoom info, necessary information uh, to mail in uh, to only these students to uh, have this scheduling conflict, but uh, if any of other uh, student who also uh, like to take this early exam, then please let me know uh, in through email. So then I can send uh, you also the login information so that you can take this early exam. Now, the potential problem is as perhaps uh, I don't know how many um, uh, students uh, expressed this particular uh, practical concern or not, uh, but I just heard uh, this uh, concern was delivered through from the <coughs> university office that uh, some actually um, have a little concern about. So since we have these two different exam uh, timing, so uh, what if this information of exams is uh, spilled, leaked over to others. So then it wouldn't be uh, fair to those older students. Yeah, that's a legitimate, valid concern. Mm. So, uh, so actually the university uh, suggested me to consider some other alternatives like uh, one is uh, reschedule the exam so that everybody can take the exam on the same date but that would be extremely extremely chaotic unless if I decided to go back to the original our December 18th uh, exam date which uh, I'm kind of really uh, reluctant because of the reason the actually the reason original reason why I decided to push this exam date back to several days is because at least you can have a little more time uh, so I wouldn't uh, go back to that original then the another alternative then um, all this uh, communication with every one of you and try to have one um, setup of a date that everyone will uh, on which everyone can actually make but uh, that would be uh, nearly almost impossible because everybody everybody has a different agenda and scheduling uh, well first of all it's all my fault uh, to begin with so yeah i feel 100 uh, percent uh, or maybe 200 percent uh, responsibility on that but but <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so that wouldn't be, uh, I also uh, think, some very good idea. And another mm, I, uh, the suggestion is so that uh, then um, to find a way of testing a method so that uh, this different timing scheduling wouldn't affect uh, all this fairness of, so that uh, even if the information is the, uh, available to earlier to some other very small number of people it wouldn't affect the final actually the result of the grading uh, I don't know what that means probably uh, try to switch this uh, <coughs> testing method into some reporting well uh, that is also kind of a, it would be such a, a very short notice so I wouldn't uh, so finally, what I have actually have in, uh, even though the chances are, because only very small number of students uh, would take the early exam, so uh, probability of these uh, few students would actually dare to uh, reveal this information to other 
the rest of the student would be very low but still one cannot rule that possibility entirely uh, so uh, here's what I'm going to do I'm going to generate two different versions of the exam early version and a late version and these all this exam the degree of the difficulty and uh, I will carefully weigh out this the di distribution of the, the, uh, the difficulty level and uh, the exam proportions uh, over the uh, co covering all the entire the lecture material so that it will be equally way out uh, so at least personally I strongly believe I can so that I can strongly believe that there won't be any kind of a bias between these two exams and these exams will be uh, different enough so that <clears throat> even though uh, the students who take the exam uh, late even if some information are uh, late uh, one uh, affect any uh, practically to the result is that's what I'm going to do it would be obviously that would be uh, very very uh, more painful uh, for me to prepare such an exam but that's uh, this type of uh, the punishment that I have to uh, take uh, swallow I guess so that's what I'm going to do so if uh, some of you have a real uh, concern about this uh, potential <coughs> Uh, the misconduct and unfairness then I can uh, assure you but uh, there will be the chances uh, uh, chance of having that type of uh, thing happening is very 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 minimal with that uh, okay just let's cut uh, the other whole the scrap out of it and try to jump on to, and, and hurry up uh, we have a lot of material to make up huh? So in this new chapter is about now the uh, the core central core of this uh, gene activity. So as this cartoon uh, trying to <coughs> uh, emphasize the the connections among this DNA and RNA and proteins, all these are three major components of this flow of genetic information into fruition so this dna the information carrier of all our the building block of uh, dna is there is a reason why dna is called uh, the the blueprint cells life's blueprint so it is a designer so all those information necessary for building some organism and and maintaining uh, proper function is all within this DNA information. How? Uh, because DNA contains the information for making all those proteins. Why proteins are so critical in such tasks? Like how their proteins can. Uh, <clears throat> make all those necessary uh, activities possible only protein because protein uh, after all if you think about it protein is only one of those four different types of uh, macro molecules as we went over and how only why and, and only protein among many other things it is because as we already have seen proteins are in many different ways are actually determining the fate and activity of an organism and actual the shape of an organism can be generated and maintained by various activities of proteins including proteins serve as an enzymes and protein serves as a, some of the very structural thing and so idea is even if you want to make a generate the cell membrane Cell membrane is basically made up of what? The lipids. Lipids by layer, phospholipid by layer, mind you. However, if you want to build just a phospholipid by layer as it is, 
And inside of a cell, actually, a lot of different protein in the form of an enzyme and some of the structural things have to <coughs> uh, intervene so that finally all this uh, phosphorylated bile can be generated and maintained. And this is one example. Even though I explained that uh, this phospholipid bile formation is probably one of those uh, rare examples that can be generated without adding any enzyme catalytic activity. But in reality, every, 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 all these little things, little structural things and activities cannot be uh, possible without the existence of many different proteins. So that's why protein is everything. And how do you make protein? It's all according to the instructions already present in your gene on your DNA. And the link, connection between this information and protein, actual tangible protein, is lies at this RNA. RNA is the, the intermediator, mediator mediator between this actual information because this DNA, the information in the DNA is actually a conceptual thing, nothing tangible. And how, how do you actually realize practically into the real thing? And there goes the RNA. RNA can somehow convert this information into real, uh, once again, I repeat this particular ugly vocabulary which is a tangible thing okay so anyway dna is the information of life so okay dna where is the dna we all know that the place uh, all this dna uh, it, uh considering this eukaryote uh prokaryote doesn't have any nucleus but let's just uh, forget about that things but let's focus on <coughs> us eukaryotes we are uh, a member of the eukaryote, so eukaryote hold this genome is organized into some kind of a specific uh, structure called the chromosome, right? So this is a chromosome, and this chromosome structure is uh, something that contains the DNA, which means actually the chromosome itself is not only entirely DNA only. Chromosome contains something else. Actually, chromosome structure is if you consider this chromosome. So it's a very long structure. Half of them is probably proteins. Lots of proteins are there, and another half is actually DNAs. It's because of this uh, chemical composition in early days, scientists uh, had a real trouble uh, in pointing out which is of the two protein or dna which is the, actually the genetic material uh, all those renowned scientists had a uh, problem and finally with uh, several series of uh, in, uh, ingenious experiments uh, which culminated in the watson creek that famous watson and cricks those who <coughs> form the correct model, structural model of the DNA double helix uh, was the <coughs> the final uh, exclamation point then everybody finally agreed upon okay fine uh, the DNA uh, is the genetic material for this human genome only speaking of this human genome we all already know that DNA consists of the individual the component which we call the nucleotides and then how many nucleotides are there in our uh, whole entire chromosome which is about three billion pairs three billion base pairs because dna uh, is a double helical uh, structures and those three billion nucleotides are somehow segmented divided into 23 different chromosomes Although, yeah, we all know that uh, actual number of chromosomes in our cells, the body cells, those are normal body cells, the name for this body cell, what was that? It's a somatic cell. And what's the, the counterpart of this somatic cell? 
there is a different type of cell in our body actually, which is almost every cell is a body cell. However, some very specialized cell which is gamete, the sperm or an egg. These are the gamete, the sex cells, which their sole functions are actually in the reproductions. And they are actually different in terms of chromosome number as we went over. These body cells, even though there are 23, all our genomes, the DNA is divided into 23 different chromosomes. However, this chromo will have a double of the 23 chromosomes because our whole these body cells are a result of those <coughs> combining activity of your sperm and egg from <coughs> respectively from your mother and oh, sperm and egg respectively from father and mother uh, to combine so that have this 46 number of chromosome which we call as a diploid right so, so having Two sets of identical chromosomes is a diploid. On the other hand, these gametes are haploid, which means actually if you look in the sperm and egg, actually if you and then count the number of different chromosomes, then there are only 23 and nothing else. You have only 23 chromosomes here. On the other hand, in every other body cells, the, which we call the somatic cells, the uh, number of chromosomes are 46 because there are two. It, for each different chromosome, you have one more because of this reason. So anyway, so that's why we usually describe this as a 2n equals 46. Here, then what is this n? So how do you define this n? So this n is n differs in every different species of the organism. So here, when we describe our genome organization in chromosome, we usually describe it as it is 2n equals 46, and which means this n number for human is n equals 23. It's just you do the math, simple arithmetic. However, this n number is different in the case of a different organism. So, n is a number of unique chromosomes of a species or an individual where so n can be defined as the haploid chromosome number of a given uh, species. So that, for example, this dog uh, scientific name uh, is a canis lupus uh, familiaris. Uh, even though their genome size, entire genome size is very similar to that of a human, which means probably their genome size is about 3 billion too. However, their genome is described as a 2n equals a 78, which means for dogs, their, uh, the haploid uh, chromosome number n would be uh, this divided 35 uh, on 39, right? So, and in the case of a fruit fly, a very tiny little insect, and this n number equals only four, which means they have eight chromosomes, the diploid number is. And this plant, which uh, it, it may look in very insignificant, humble, but and the plant research field it is one of the uh, most significant and influential <coughs> plant uh, is scientific name is arabidopsis uh, and and it has uh, only five haploid number it's a very small genome and cone on the other and, and, and equals 10 so the idea is Every different organism has a different uh, chromosome number. Tiger, and lion, chromosome number is 19. And actually, they are. Not only do they have the same chromosome number, the haploid number, but their organization is uh, nearly identical. So that's why they can interbreed. Uh, the only reason why they don't nature in nature is their long 
uh, history of uh, their uh, in their habitats, the environment, they've been separated uh, <coughs> each other. So they don't. Uh, but physically, uh, yeah, they can be forced to mate and then produce viable offspring, which is the basis of the uh, biological species uh, definition. And uh, hyena <laughs> is a, so already having the two different chromosome number and uh, there is a no way hyena and lion uh, they are actually in their res original environment they are very very uh, unfriendly actually they are considered to be in the, one of the major uh, enemies in between but anyway they wouldn't uh, they can't physically uh, interbreed between horse having 32 uh, haploid chromosome number, a donkey 31. So in this case, horse and donkey cannot uh, produce offspring between uh, their the mate. However, in this uh, very interesting specific occasion, the donkey and uh, horse somehow uh, can be forced to interbreed and then make offspring however the problem is the offspring as a result uh, is uh, <coughs> not for Ryan is so this uh, is a, according to that our original definition of the biological species concepts uh, they are they cannot be regarded as uh, the same species because their offspring is not viable I mean the that can produce another <coughs> the offspring next generation. So the mule as a result horse versus donkey will be able to generate a mule but this mule is a sterile. The reason why is because it rise in this chromosome number and organization. Horse has a 32 chromosome and donkey has 31 chromosome. So uh, in their particular arrangement, when they are trying to find their homologue, during this, uh, the preparation of this, the gametes, it's different homologous chromosome. Do you still remember this homologous chromosome? This homologous chromosome, each pairs must find their partner and then line up. That's how you go through this particular the cell division to generate this gamete. But here in this case, how can they find their respective uh, pair partner? And that uh, would <coughs> generate a kind of a disaster. That's why even though they somehow uh, have a lock uh, to generate this offspring in this mating uh, their respective this mules gamete uh, cannot cannot produce this the equally matching the, the cells that's why uh, this mule is a sterile chimpanzee 24 so this one is we have 23 chromosome number and the chimpanzee has a 24 uh, different haploid chromosome number is a something that uh, one may be one of the reason why uh, this even if we tried the chimpanzee and human cannot uh, make any of this breeding successful so uh, at this point one might wonder that okay okay so this chromosome number as this chromosome number is a something that uh, is a, uh, correlated with their, their advanced status in terms of the evolution not necessarily so as we have already seen the chromosome number wise this the horse has a uh, not only the genome size too just just because you have a larger genome size doesn't mean that you are more advanced than the ones that have a smaller genome side 
sometimes it actually uh, <coughs> it is a, 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 as it is so that if you look up the genome size of a tiny insect and compare with that of a human obviously uh, uh, we would have a much larger genome size but not necessarily sometimes actually some very uh, small single-celled organism like a protist has much 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 larger genome size than human so that shouldn't be any parameter uh, for determining the actual relative uh, the stages uh, status of uh, advancement of uh, any uh, organism the genome size and also speaking of this n number n number is only simply some kind of indication of how many different chromosomes they carry so one example of this butterfly this particular butterfly so the class blue uh, butterfly has uh, this incredibly large number of chromosomes even uh, scientists couldn't uh, specifically confirm exact number of chromosomes in this uh, particular uh, case so it's anywhere between about 224 to 226 is some kind of a range of chromosome number in this small uh, insect so <clears throat> you get the message yes and another thing is another thing that i want to also hear although i did not uh, <coughs> Uh, right at this point is the number of genes so we relatively has a larger genome size as uh, one of the top at the pinnacle of uh, this evolution tree the human so that means the number of genes that we carry would be probably the the, the largest so like if you compare the number of genes with, uh, of ours with that of a dogs or with that of a small insect, uh, then obviously at the, we, we, would, we would carry the huge, huge uh, more number of genes, not, not necessarily that is also. So like fruit, which has only how many chromosomes a haploid number it's a n equals four and human n equals 23 and 3 billion uh nucleotide genome so one would automatically actually assume that the number of gene will uh, carried in the human genome would be probably 10 times as many as that of a fruit fly no that is not the case only only about twice as many i guess at at most is in between this fly, uh, fruit fly and human that doesn't add up so that how can how can that be possible so anyway let's um, move on so just because you have a larger size number of gene that doesn't mean that you would automatically have many 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 more genes the gene and your whole genome size is totally two different animal is the <coughs> the message over here so once again this is the relationship between gene and rna and protein so this rna is some kind of a the bellboy between dna and protein uh, so this dna is uh, structurally speaking is a long chain of a nucleotide as we all know this dna one individual nucleotide looks like this right uh, here each nucleotide then when it is about to be incorporated into it looks like some it's very uh, it resembles it is the structure actually exact structure of ATP the energy the only thing different is here <clears throat> if that was an ATP that energy it would have been OH instead of the single hydrogen so this is uh, we all know that this is a, a nucleotide uh, which is a dna nucleotide deoxy 
If this was in an OH, then it is an RNA nucleotide, and that famous ATP that we know of is exactly this type of uh, structure. Uh, here, the only idea is I'm trying to <coughs> remind you this. So, DNA or RNA is the same thing. This is a kind of a long chain of each individual nucleotide. Uh, there are four different types of nucleotide, whether in the case of a DNA or in the case of RNA, right? Hey, what did I do? Why? Okay, so, however, uh, in either cases, DNA or RNA, the only difference is here, the nitrogen base. Here, some unique whether it's in adenine or guanine or cytosine and thymine in the case of DNA or adenine or guanine or the uracil or cytosine in the case of the RNA and the nucleotide, individual nucleotide as we learned in previous chapter was like basically organization was like this so 1,5 carbon sugar and one nitrogenous base and one phosphate, right? However, here in this cartoon, what you we see here is like here the way they are actually the assemblies of chains of the DNA or RNA here. What we are looking at is so existing nucle uh, nucleic acid, the chain polymer, consisting of only two nucleotide and if this new member is trying to <coughs> be inserted into this existing polymer now it this new member must come in this form of the having two more phosphate group triphosphate nucleotide instead of our the previous uh, structure of uh, having one only one phosphate only why because by doing so actually uh, this insertion of a new uh, new nucleotide in the existing thing can become a uh, spontaneous reaction by shedding up this is something like a very similar to hydrolysis of ATP so when you do you have to take this two phosphate off the break this phosphate group chemically speaking which is what what do you think which is uh, <coughs> catabolic reaction so it will generate energy so this building of the synthesis of this chain the polymer is an anabolic reaction which which will take require the input of the energy so where would you get this energy required for this uh, synthesis of the nucleic acid the long polymer individual member itself will carry in the in this form so when it does it will take up this two phosphate group which will generate obviously energy necessary for this is this how they have this organization um, so this is a, a type of a nucleic acid and the dna and also rna as well is organized into some specific uh, way we call it an antiparallel double helix. To understand such antiparallel double helix, helix we have to, uh, although it is a little a bit of a complex thing, but we have to be able to understand this structure, the long, long chain, and uh, try to find some unique feature of in terms of a direction. Let's here, let's take a look at this uh, nucleic acid or polymer of nucleotides having four different nucleotides. Even. But at this point, on top and bottom, I hope you can find a fine difference in here the nucleotide making up this first nucleotide on top and the nucleotide, the last nucleotide to get inserted in this polymer 
how uh, are they different in each other. So this first nucleotide here still have this phosphate group. And the last nucleotide of the, any uh, DNA or RNA strand still have this particular OH. Why am I bringing up this particular phosphate and the OH is because for the rest of all other nucleotide, if you try, uh, if you look at, then this particular position of OH is consumed. You don't get to find any. And also, similarly, this particular phosphate group is not free anymore due to that particular way of uh, bond connection, chemical bond connection during this nucleic acid uh, <coughs> assembly. Uh, that's what you get to uh, observe. The first nucleotide of any this polymer of nucleic acid still has this phosphate, uh, the part phosphate group free. And on the other hand, the last nucleotide also still has this free OH uh, part, OH group. And for some reason, we designate this particular area as a 5 prime end. Why? Because there is a, actually a, the numbering system of the sugar. There's a, any sugar actually has a, there's a convention of uh, putting some order as a number. So this is number one, number two, three, and four. And there is a five so this actually phosphate is attached to the carbon number five so that's why we this call this phosphate as five prime number five five prime phosphate so this first uh, five prime phosphate is still free in any of if you look at any of this long DNA or RNA uh, strand, that's uh, what you get to observe. On the other hand, if you look at the other end, this, all those different strands of DNA and RNA, you get to see in the last nucleotide, you get to see this free OH. And this free OH, we call that as a 3 prime OH and you get the idea why it is called a 3 prime because this is number 1 carbon and 2 and this is number 3 carbon and this OH is attached to the number 3 carbon so this uh, nomenclature the way you we call that as a 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl group is one of these the characteristic feature of any uh, DNA or RNA polymer strand so once we <coughs> have understood this the naming system then we can forget about this phosphate whatever hydroxyl why don't we just call that as a respectively the 5 prime and 3 prime and everyone understands, everyone in this field understands when someone refers to, hey, this 5 prime and 3 prime, that means, oh, I know what you mean. So this 5 prime and 3 prime is uh, used to uh, re uh, point out the relative direction or position of DNA or RNA nucleotide. So if you are now comfortable about this, then we can go back to this now. So anti-parallel double helix means what does that mean? Is this? So if you look at look up <coughs> these two DNA strand held to form a double heli helical structure, double strand, uh, the usual typical uh, organization of a DNA in our cell, then what you see is look. They are actually arranged in upside down like this. So here in on your left strand, what you see is the five prime. Where is the five prime of this uh, strand? It's up there. On top, 
this is a five prime, isn't it? Okay. So five prime is over here, which means, oh shoot, sorry. Which means the three prime is the other end. On the other hand, that the complement is a complementary strand. Uh, the five prime is at the bottom and three prime is up. So the way the DNA strands are held together is we can <coughs> describe like this. Oh no, in the other way around probably. So one strand goes like this, this direction from five prime to three prime and the other complementary strand is in the opposite orientation of from five prime to three prime upward and in between they they are held together due to this hydrogen bond here hydrogen bond of this particular complementary you know, the base pairs that's how <coughs> they are organized so this the opposite format the, of this arrangement we call it anti-parallel. One is going this way and the other one is going that way. It's anti-parallel uh, double helix. And this anti-parallelity is actually also applies to uh, when DNA is trying to pair, it, they can. Uh, DNA, so DNA, if DNA is trying to pair with the RNA, they can as long as their respective complementary base pair can fit because the thymine the DNA can pair with the R A and with the RNA and uh, A and DNA can pair with the uracil in the RNA right because they are virtually the same thing so the RNA also the making complementary base pairing can uh, and, and not only can they should uh, <coughs> pair with in this the opposite orientation so this DNA RNA we usually call the DNA RNA hybrid also uh, is organized in the anti-parallel way. Then what about the RNA uh, double uh, strand? Sometimes they can, even though RNA usually they prefer RNA prefer to form their own complementary base pairing like this, so that they can uh, form their own secondary structure as we have seen in the uh, case of uh, the ribozyme and many other RNAs but uh, if they want to they can pair this RNA RNA but the thing is these two RNA must pair anti-parallel way is always that is, this is a rule that's what I'm talking about so this is structure model and actually this DNA double helical structure was the first uh, is that the clue came from this uh, the bright young uh, female scientist uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, who unfortunately uh, had a very short uh, life uh, at the time of this Watson Creek. They were actually fierce. They are very close friend. I wouldn't really say very close, but they were. Uh, <clears throat> they were kind of a friends and also the, the competitor. Uh, between and this Rosalind Franklin's the experimental data uh, probably you may not be able to see what uh, this, this the film shows but this is called the result of the x-ray crystallography and basically what it shows is how DNA double helix shows them kind of pattern generate some of the pattern to simply put uh, if you expose this any object on the beam of an x-ray and this beam of x-ray will hit this object and then they have some kind of a scattered pattern after that so if you place a film an x-ray film that you can uh, record this the hitting pattern of this x-ray beam then you can generate some of very unique pattern and if you are trained well enough then you can interpret so that you can have some idea very good idea about the actual shape of this uh, molecule so here this pattern generates some kind of a helical structure 
So that, that is the first evidence that scientists try to uh, they, they begin to uh, think, okay, so DNA might be arranged in some kind of a helical form. And then she, uh, Rosalind Franklin, personally believed that oh, so this might be uh, this DNA uh, is organized in the triple double helix. And then she worked very hard uh, day and night to resolve this experimentally. On the other hand, Watson and Crick, uh, these two young scientists over here, uh, James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, taking a pose on their actual original model of DNA double helix here. They thought, uh, without ha ha having any evidence, uh, the experimental evidence, they kind of uh, have a hunch about their uh, reasonable hunch. I mean, based upon some of the very well thought, careful uh, reasoning, of course, they thought this DNA uh, is in the form of a double helix. And the only difference here was Rosalind Franklin uh, went out of her way to prove this her idea experimentally. Whereas Watson and Crick uh, try to fit all, all those data uh, to make fit into their original the hypothesis of what theory. That's the difference. And so obviously in this case uh, it would have been taken much 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 shorter time. Obviously, so that's how and that's why they won in this race of uh, actually revealing the correct structure of DNA. And yeah, so that's here. Here is some kind of a dirty secret uh, involves them. Actually, this Maurice Wilkins, uh, who also is a co-recipient of this Nobel uh, Prize, uh, was uh, a boss of the Rosalind uh, Franklin. And the only reason why this Washington Creek uh, could have access to this uh, Rosalind Franklin's original experimental data was. Uh, he stole the Rosalind Franklin's data and then brought up to Washington Creek so that they can uh, build their uh, all this model based upon this uh, data. So that's why <laughs> that's why Morris Wilkins was uh, a, a part of this the that particular year's Nobel Prize uh, uh, winner. And uh, what about this Rosalind Franklin? Uh, Rosalind Franklin, if she were alive back then, or by the time of this uh, Nobel Prize, uh, <coughs> the the announcement that year, uh, she would have obviously also be included in one of those recipients. But unfortunately, she so already passed away due to the cancer uh, at the time. Uh, so. The rules, the stu stupid rule of this novel, whatever is, uh, it never goes out to those who no longer exist on Earth. Is uh, that's the only reason why she wasn't able to be within this the list of this honorable mentions. Uh, anyway, so that's the structure. But now, uh, getting back to into the overall general uh, landscape of DNA. And these nucleotides uh, actually can go into the uh, random fashion into to, to assemble any DNA uh, strand. So in other words, theoretically, uh, theoretically uh, speaking, how many different ways of actually you generate different DNA fragments? So if you imagine, let's say there is a DNA fragment of only uh, consistent of only hundred nucleotides. Now how many different ways of you actually build the, the different DNA fragment? Then you do the math, so there are four to the hundredth different ways of because at each position you can have a four different nucleotide can come up. That's uh, the mathematics would predict uh, probability. So in other words, what's the uh, idea? What what's bottom line of this uh, sentence? So there are more than enough sometimes you wonder and you are a little bit worried about 
hey DNA uh, after all DNA is only making is a kind of a combination of the four different nucleotide so the one of the major essence critical essence of the uh, uh, DNA as a uh, being able to serve as a genetic material is huge different diversity how can how can you generate this diversity out of only four different nucleotides as Zone my wonder, and actually that was one of the major reason why in early on, uh, early days of this uh, <coughs> early 20th century, or uh, actually, uh, the leading majority of the vast majority of the scientists involved here in this business believed that uh, I mentioned that DNA, or it, the chromosome, chemically when they analyze this chemical composition of the uh, new chromosome it turns out that uh, half of them uh, uh, proteins and half of them are this dna the nucleotides so in other words four only four different combination there are they thought there are only so much you can do whereas proteins are uh, they knew already back then uh, proteins are made of 20 different uh, amino acids so which one is actually uh, able to generate more diversity obviously protein they thought so they what they thought was basically proteins are the real genetic material and then the only reason why dna's are also found in the chromosome is uh, dna's are very stable so and DNA is providing some kind of structural support to this gene, natural genes, the proteins. And once you have this fixed opinion, and it's very, very difficult to change your opinion to or have an open mind. So even though couple of several scientists showed the their experimental result, which indicate otherwise the other way around the mainstream scientists are very 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 reluctant to accept the new idea no that can't be that must have been some kind of a uh, contamination or anything like that until the finally that nailed in the coffin so the final blow uh, came from this actual structural model of dna generated by this Watson and Crick and Co. And then by looking at this structure, they all understand, oh, yeah, that's right. Why? What's the uh, significance of DNA, uh, the, the double helical structure, which are uh, held by this complementary? Base pairing. The significance is then now this I have just emphasized this feature in the pre midterm exam so you don't really have to worry about this thing anymore for your the final exam but anyway I'm saying this once again this self replication so that's another very significant <clears throat> feature that need to be considered is uh, if that thing uh, is to act as a generic materials then it should be able to demonstrate this ability of so-called self-replication because this DNA is a genetic material they should be able to somehow generate this mode of how they uh, efficiently can replicate in this uh, very smooth uh, fashion and once you look at the structure of DNA it appears to everyone it appears that all oh, that kind of structure should be able to generate this so-called self-replication mode of this uh, duplication genetic. so okay hands down okay so dna is the guy is that's how finally <coughs> uh, agreed upon so now let's get back to this whole this chromosome and dna so you hold your gen genome the significant why do we act, uh, 
put some kind of a special emphasis on the DNA because DNA serves as a, the genetic material, which means that DNA on the chromosome uh, contains genes. But then the next question is, uh, all those areas in your three billion nucleotides, things of all these genes, the DNA contains every every spot of the DNA uh, are the part of genes. Is the question, and the simple answer is a no. Okay. Um, so only only very uh, specific area of your G, uh, the DNA uh, defined is defined as genes. Uh, this is one such an, uh, the example illustrating such future. Now you have this three billion, but more than three billion nucleotides of your human genomes. Then how many genes are there up uh, in those three billion nucleotides? And uh, if you try to compare the actual known, the number of genes identified after the completion of this human genome project, it's it's even less than twenty three thousand genes. So in other words, if all those entire areas are actually make up uh, the whole taken by genes, then you simply do the math. So three point three billion divided by twenty three, then you have this the average length of uh, each genes. How many nucleotides are there in in on average in in each gene? Is that's what you would came up with in calculation? So. Then is something like 150,000 uh, nucleotides, which is uh, very long. That is your initial calculation. However, uh, in reality, uh, you know, uh, in real life cases, in average length of gene in the mammals is about only 30,000. So this is a big difference. So how do you account for such big difference? That means. Oh, there is a certain regions are not doing anything. They are just, uh, uh, <coughs> bluntly put, they are just a garbage area. They don't do anything. They are bummed. It's the uh, one, one of the probably the most uh, straightforward explanation for this discrepancy. Uh, so here is one such uh, illustrating feature of uh, that uh, characteristic. So in chromosome, if you Chromosome is once we already know that chromosome is actually highly compact structure. So if you untangle, if you pull uh, the chromosome into one once again this uh, un unorganized uh, one uh, single strand of the DNA, what you get to see is only certain segment of the uh, DNA area make up a gene and followed by the so non-gene area. So in this black area, doesn't it contain any kind of information uh, serving as a gene, but something just sit there. So those area is called the intergenic region, which is not serving as a gene. So actually the more, the majority of area on the chromosomes are the intergenic region, not doing anything. The area uh, defined as gene is actually much uh, rarer uh, in our <coughs> chromosome organization. So here then, probably it's a good time to define uh, precisely about the gene. What's gene then? Uh, how do we define a gene? What is it? So, is the once let's just take a, go over the first uh, concept the, from the classical uh, genetic point of view. The classical genetics is called the name of classical genetics is so called transmission genetics. Uh, uh, this from the classical genetic viewpoint, or the gene definition of a gene. Uh, was some of the factors that determine the characters. What is characters? And what is trait? I believe, uh, I remember I briefly went over this, the difference between character and trait. Uh, so, <clears throat> these two 
the terms revisited it over here but uh, anyway the significance of this the classical genetics which was uh, founded by Gregor Mendel in 19th centuries uh, the Catholic priest and had an experiment on garden pea and then uh, during, after that he formulated the, the correct concept of genes before people uh, had only a very fuzzy vague idea about what genes are something like uh, like water like mixable uh, things are genes so your father's genes your mother's genes combined together and just like your know, blue water uh, and uh, gray water combined with some kind of different colors and then the problem is uh, if the genes are something like uh, the mixable things some intermediate uh, the feature characteristic will appear in your offspring sons and daughters but the problem is that then this mixed up character the genes the features cannot be re-separated so that's the actual problem but uh, this Mendel for the first time thought uh, viewed the genes uh, the other way around otherwise so he thought these genes as a kind of separable factors uh, these days we all know that genes uh, organized as chromosomes it can be separated and this actually the homologous chromosome pairs are separate into when we are about to produce this gamete sperms and eggs these homologous and chromosome pairs segregate separate um, and then later when this sperm and eggs recombine you through the sexual reproduction they recombine and then re, uh, meet again and then when they do because of this the way we engage in, in the sexual reproductions then all this recombination occurs and that's how we uh, that's the reason why the, your offspring sons and daughters have uh, some feature from father and some feature from mother and uh, sort of uh, stuff like that so anyway this the characters are determined by the genes in other words like flower color flower color is one such character and pointing out this flower color there are many many different alternatives right so red flower white flower violet and pink and so many different types of alternative version under each category of character and that's kind of a, the uh, organized and defined by the works of classical genetics founded by majority of them were actually done by Mendel himself so <clears throat> So certain character, as I like say right now, uh, several different traits usually exist. So traits are different alternatives of on one big category of any of uh, the characteristics that is determined by what gene. So once again, gene, your gene will determine some specific character. flower color, your eye color, your height, uh, your shape, whatever, anything. But on the one character, many, many different versions, different types of versions are all these traits. Why do these different traits occur? Because the gene, the genetic sequence, the genetic sequence is different. Even even under certain one particular gene if you examine the dna sequence of that particular area defining the one particular character this gene then you will easily understand that uh, the dna sequence um, uh, may not be identical in different individuals and that's why you have some different traits in different individuals so this is the basis of your variation in each different character right so 
uh, that's what it is. So in other words, we are our deployed individual. We are deployed individual, which means we have two homologous chromosome. If chromosome is the location that carries different genes, because genes are, after all, genes are on DNA, and DNAs are organized in chromosome. So in this two homologous chromosome, let's look at one particular location. This particular location would actually be defined by some particular gene. Yes. So this is the location of one particular gene and this exact Gene, how many copies of gene do you have as an <coughs> diploid individual? You have two copies of the gene, right? So it's one and the other one. However, so as a diploid individual, you can have two copies of genes, but theoretically, you know that these two copies may not necessarily be identical. Because two different traits can come. Because this one, after all, this one came from your mother. And this one came from your father. So how can you expect that this, the nature of these two genes on the same location, but came from different origin of this chromosome? How can you expect that would be always identical? It could be different. And this is, so this is the source of such potential variation. So in other words, here in this sentence, what this sentence is trying to deliver uh, is because you have uh, the maximum capacity of uh, carrying two chromosomes in the form of homologous chromosome. That's what this term diploid means. So the maximum, the number of different traits you can carry per each character is how many? Two. Because these two could be identical. In that case, you don't have any variation. But some cases, these two corresponding genes could be different. Then you have two different traits per this particular character. Say this is a, like your hair color, say this is a, it's the way uh, you, your height or whatever. Okay. However, how many, how many maximum traits, different traits are possible per character? Disregarding your like individual cell or in uh, or individual organism cases, but simply from a strict uh, theoretical point of view, how many different variations can be possible for any particular character as a uh, that a gene can generate? <coughs> Countless, right? You can have uh, as many variations, theoretically speaking, because any difference, any DNA sequence variation can be potentially a different trait, potentially. Any different DNA sequence variation may not actually generate any differences in terms of traits, but sometimes can. So the number of possible different traits per character is like almost uh, the enormous. But on the other hand, in speaking of one individual, uh, as a person or as an organism, the maximum number of uh, different traits that one can carry is only two in the case of a diploid individual. If you are not a diploid, if you are an individual as an individual, as a uh, haploid, then the number of different traits you can, that you can carry is only one. On the other hand, if you are like tetraploid, The tetraploid means 
having four different sets of chromosomes. In the case, in the uh, many plants are actually tetraploid. Although in uh, <coughs> animal, uh, tetraploids are very rare, so uh, it's only one or two only reported cases of uh, tetraploids uh, have been found in the case of animals. Uh, but in plants, uh, they are very, very, very common in tetraploids. Anyway, in the case of a tetraploid, you have four different maximum number of the different traits are possible because of the same reason. That. So this Mendel, as I said, uh, was the <clears throat> founder of transmission genetics. And so he was the one who established these concepts of heredity like this. So here, each on in the summary of this uh, his experiment, uh, he focused on actually seven different seven different characters, right? And ooh, extremely, he was extremely lucky in that for each uh, different characters, the traits, the different traits uh, he. Uh, was able to follow is only two each different trait either in the case of flower color uh, flower color uh, is, uh, gives in in many many generations of this uh, the crossing but the breeding experiment white or purple flower color those are two only in the case of uh, the, the P seed color yellow or green like so always like two different alternatives I don't want if these alternatives uh, were something more than two, like three or four different alternatives uh, are generated out of this character, the experiment would have been much, much, much messier. So the experiment would not have been as successful as uh, uh, what it is, actually. So anyway, uh, he went uh, over this typical experiment in uh, having conceptualizing uh, this idea of uh, uh, genetics which uh, is determined by some factor this whatever the factor is each different individual carry this factor as a two double thing and during this sexual transmission uh, the sexual reproduction when they try to produce this gamete only one of the, these two uh, get to participate in this mating and this which one of the two will participate is uh, solely determined by random this randomness actually is very good in that now you can apply the rules of mathematics probability so that's how actually he uh, that's what he established as so, well which is, is extremely extremely valuable and that affected all the fate of genetics ever since uh, here in this class but uh, I'm not trying to go over and all this his details of classical genetics we don't have such time but the only reason why I brought up this Mendel's original classical genetics work is now out of that we have some of some particular terminologies that still we have to be aware of and then be able to distinguish what's that. Uh, some of them are listed over here in this table. So in gene and allele and locus and genotype and heterozygous, homozygous and phenotype of a trait or whatever and characters or characteristics type of thing. So major or major these terminologies that we are going to define with this before we move on to more modern so it's called molecular aspect of this gene, we have to take care of this classical concept of gene because that's where we originally came from uh, so this uh, this diagram uh, will try to summarize uh, all these different uh, terminology re uh, related to genetics 
So first thing is this gene uh, so this gene we all know that are located on chromosomes genes uh, for now let's define gene as a something that uh, produce a different kind of a characters right so all those characters are found on the chromosome so where so then we have this the particular location of each different genes on the chromosome at specific location so such particular location of the, uh, the gene on the chromosome is called locus okay and many locuses uh, is are called a loci this is plural of the locus so in korean it's called the whatever yes so this one locus and another locus and the other locus all these three locus loci are the ones that each of them represent the different characters right so in different location of the chromosome now let's focus on one particular locus now we have, uh, as a diploid organism, we have uh, two homologous chromosomes. In other words, and each given locus, the same characters, same gene, uh, is located. However, actual status of that gene could be different. So this specific status of a particular gene or a particular character is called alleles. So, for each character, you have two different alleles, possible, maximum. As a diploid organism, you have two versions of a different alleles because those two are the two different traits on the one same characters, right? And so these alleles, however, uh, not necessarily they, these two different alleles should be always different. Some cases, these two alleles are identical on the same characters. Then it is called homozygous. In re with respect to this particular gene or a particular character, this person is homozygous. However, uh, in the case of these two different alleles are actually different than this individual is called heterozygous for this particular characters. So in other words, as a one single given individual, uh, I could be a homozygous for the hemoglobin, but it could be heterozygous for like some insulin uh, genes, uh, so to speak. So each different genes, you could be either homozygous or heterozygous, in other words, having two different traits or uh, the identical traits. Depends on all different circumstances. So that's the, uh, the terminology distinguish, distinguishing the characters of the status of either identical or different, homo and hetero. Now the question is, then in the case of this heterozygous, because now you immediately see a potential problem. Let's see if this particular lo locus was was the one character that uh, assigning human eye color for the, for the sake of an argument although human eye color, color is not determined by one single gene uh, is many different gene many different characters co combined together to uh, determine one such character uh, this is the example of this human eye color and uh, so so are many many different examples so not necessarily always uh, a single gene will be only responsible for one single character. Sometimes many genes will <coughs> decide one trait of a particular character. But anyway, so if, for the sake of argument, if this location, the location of the gene locus, are the one determining the human eye color, and as you can see, this orange and yellow, the two different color codes probably uh, indicate some different eye color, then 
what kind of eye color this human uh, the individual would have like orangey one left eye is an orangey and then right it is in yellow sometimes that happens ah, very rare occasion sometimes that happens due to different region okay however in the like usually normally just because uh, uh, you have two different alternatives like heterozygous status doesn't mean that your the outside appearance will follow such status but simply one of the two even if you have one gene carrying the black eye and another one is carrying brown eye but probably perhaps the your eye color would be black eye in other words in the case of this the conflict when those two alternative uh, the alleles are different only one of the two will be expressed will show up uh, outside and the other one will hide itself i will refrain myself from <coughs> showing off and those who refrain themselves so not to show uh, is called recessive and on the other hand the one showing is trait to the outside world is called dominant so this one is the one that shows in the case of this heterozygous so this is dominant or recessiveness only uh, happens in the case of a heterozygous and another thing is not always actually even if you have this heterozygous status like one of the two would be dominant and the other one would be recessive that uh, not showing up it's not always applies to every case in some cases some in the same circumstances depending on what type of genes uh, are uh, then you have some intermediate in between uh, traits is shown and in this case we call that uh, instance as an incomplete dominance just like in this pink flower color of that particular plant is a result of the red colored flower and a white colored flower so the cross between red and then white color flower generate normally you would expect either one or two if red is dominant then the the next generation of all this plant uh, color flower color will be red if the white color was dominant then the other way around but none of this but simply looks like apparent mixture intermediate mixture over between red and white this is the pink flower color so in this case we <coughs> this distinguish such an instance as an incomplete dominance so anyway uh, there is a reason why in some cases that not entirely dominant thing uh, is not generated but uh, rather some kind of uh, apparent mixture is not apparent mixture actually why because uh, if this was an apparent mixture blending then from then on from then on this then if this individual further have a children of their own the, in like self-crossing in, in the case of plants then you would from then on keep generating this own this mixture uh, trait however the original father and mothers uh, the by the way this phenotype versus genotype is phenotype is something that trait that's shown to the outside apparently to the eyes of other uh, the observers phenotype is on the other hand genotype is the actual genetic makeup so in the case of uh, this heterozygous genotypically speaking one particular individual or one particular characters could be heterozygous however phenotypically either one of the two phenotypically only dominant one dominant trait will be observed phenotypically however if this was a, a heterozygous 
Genotypically means they are heterozygous, two different things. is the difference between phenotype and genotype. So, this incomplete dominance, genotypically, even though they are heterozygous, but uh, their phenotype, phenotype is some kind of mixture. And then, the next generation, actual, their original parents' phenotype, respectively, res respectively the red flower or a white flower, will reappear is the thing that distinguishes this thing from the long long time ago incorrect concept of our gene which is a, some kind of blending which is a, uh, kind of a, uh, blending possible nature so this is uh, some rare special specific occasions uh, incomplete dominance or uh, occurs and so these are probably the terminology that you need to know uh, about the classical genetic uh, genetics concept but more importantly usually the thing i uh, emphasize about this dominant here is like dominant and res recessive and the reason behind this being dominant and being recessive is a very uh, personally uh, like a uh, importantly regarded the concept so usually people like okay if they were asked why certain character is dominant or recessive like if you they were asked then well like for example you have a and a these two different alleles these are two different alleles and this big a uh, represent the dominant and little a is a recessive and by definition this big A is dominant A uh, as an earlier dominant is because in the heterozygous heterozygous status this A shows up and that's why A is labeled as dominant and in heterostatus little a doesn't show up so this is a hiding uh, so that's why it is uh, labeled as a recessive so, so that's the usual answer but it is not something that actually answering the reason why behind it is only the answering what is dominant and what is recessive right the real reason why in this <coughs> condition certain trait is a as an alternative like allele is dominant which shows up and the other one the alternative allele does not show uh, is all something that to do with the function which function dictate all these alleles the result the different alleles the result is a, some kind of a different function as a gene and so we always compare this alternative status and all these uh, different alleles all different alleles are result of mutations huh? right So, let's say you have originally two identical alleles, the traits. You have no problem because they are identical. And somehow, through mutation, now on this particular character, you have this acquired this new allele as a result of mutation. Now the question is, now would this new allele be dominant or recessive how do you know if you look up only dna sequence and how what kind of change was made and you may think that there is no way you can 
the uh, predict whether this new mutation um, resulting in new allele be dominant or recessive. There is no way you can predict. Probably, uh, perhaps so in most of the cases, but uh, surprisingly, in uh, more than what you actually expect, you might be able to predict even whether this the end result of this new mutation result in the dominant or uh, recessive allele over this existing one. It's always relative power struggle whether I'm going to I'm the one who is going to show up I'm going to then if you are going to show up I'm going to show up too in this case then we call that as a co-dominant but in most of the cases actually uh, the co-dominant uh, trait uh, it's not usually uh, it's, uh, something that we uh, find, but usually more common is either one of the two will show up and the other one will hide as a recessive uh, trait. Why? Because it's always the, uh, related with the function. If this new mutation, the new mutation result in the loss of uh, existing function, If then, as a result of new mutation, now you have a loss of this uh, function, then what? Let's say, so this one was the one that resulting in the loss of this original function. Now you have this heterozygous. So what would be the phenotype? So just because you have lost the original function does mean that you now completely uh, incapable of the original function no uh, fortunately you don't because you have still carrying this one copy functioning copy copy of the, so thank god you are deployed so in this case this will this a will be dominant because this A is still carries the ability to carry on the function and this new allele as a result of mutation unfortunately uh, like the carries the uh, the function of the loss of a function then still this still functioning uh, alternative this allele can cover this loss of function so in between this if one of the two is the result of a loss of function then that one will be recessive right and the ones who can still provide the function will be dominant however a little small is a misnomer but if this one is something kind of a, as a result of mutation this one uh, provides kind of a new function or some sometimes this is a, a like function that interfere the original function the original function of this in either cases then this one is the one that actually shows as a phenotype so then now in these two cases all this the new mutation will be dominant right so it's all about the dominance or recessiveness is oh, well what kind of a phenotypes what type of phenotype which phenotype is the one that uh, this result will get and that is determined by this dynamics of the function is the reason okay so this from modern genetics point of view now of uh, the modern genetics is called the molecular genetics the definition of the gene is different so all this with the definition of the gene, then something else. Uh, let's continue on this 
in the next session of the lecture.